Please turn in your hymnals to the back to page 80. I'm going to read article number 24 of the Belgic Confession having to do with sanctification. Sanctification. <clears throat> I'm going to read the first part and then the, the, the second part of it uh, where we uh, come, therefore we do good works. I'll signal and then the congregation can join in. But uh, for the first part, I'll go ahead and read and follow along closely uh, here on this doctrine of sanctification. We believe that this true faith being wrought in man by the hearing of the word of God and the operation of the Holy Spirit regenerates him and makes him a new man, causing him to live a new life and freeing him from the bondage of sin. Therefore, it is so far from being true that this justifying faith makes men remiss in a pious and holy life, that on the contrary, without it, they would never do anything out of love to God, but only out of love or only out of self-love or fear of damnation. Therefore, it's impossible that this holy faith can be unfruitful in man. For we do not speak of a vain faith, but of such a faith, which is called in Scripture a faith working through love, which excites man to the practice of those works which God has commanded in his word. These works, as they proceed from the good root of faith, are good and acceptable in the sight of God, for as much as they are all sanctified by his grace. Nevertheless, they are of no account towards our justification, for it is by faith in Christ that we are justified, even before we do good works. Otherwise, they could not be good works any more than the fruit of a tree can be good before the tree itself is good. Now, please join me now as we finish uh, this um, this article 24. Therefore, we do good works, but not to merit by them, for what can we merit? Nay, we are indebted to God for the good works we do, and not he to us, since it is he who worketh in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Let us therefore attend to what is written. When ye shall have done all the things that are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which it was our duty to do. In the meantime, we do not deny that God rewards good works, but it is through his grace that he crowns his gifts. Moreover, though we do good works, we do not found our salvation upon them. For we can do no work but what is polluted by our flesh, and also punishable. And although we could perform such works, still the remembrance of one sin is sufficient to make God reject them. Thus, then, we would always be in doubt, tossed to and fro without any certainty, and our poor consciences would be continually vexed if they relied on the merits of the suffering and death of our Savior. <clears throat> have a couple of Biblical text to follow up that reading on sanctification. Uh, first, kind of the, the theme text uh, for this series of sermons. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. Uh, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification and redemption. So that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So today uh, our topic will be uh, sanctification. And then we'll be reading Romans chapter 6. Now from Romans 5 here in Romans 6, we have this transition <clears throat> from Paul uh, having explained justification by faith, now into uh, sanctification, which is different from justification, but always joined to it. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. 
How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self, or our old man, was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will not have dominion over you, since you're not under law, but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we're not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were com committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. Now I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. We do pray, Heavenly Father, at this time now that thy Holy Spirit would illumine our minds and that we, your people, would be sanctified as we give attention uh, to the Scriptures, that we would be uh, under your transforming power. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've been looking at this general theme of boasting in God's wisdom and power and now it's time for us to focus our attention upon boasting in God's wisdom and power in our sanctification. To sanctify means to make holy. It means an actual changing of the heart, changing of you uh, inside from sin to obedience, from rebellion to submission, from being defiled uh, to being pure, from being self-centered to being Christ-centered from being indifferent to being zealous for God's holiness and truth, from being captivated by idols to being captivated by Christ. And we must keep in mind as we understand this sanctification of the heart that this is not moralism. This is conformity to Christ. This is an actual personal change so that Jesus Christ is on the increase in you and there's the dynamic of your union and communion with Jesus Christ playing itself out in your actual transformation no it's sanctification is not moralism it's not a change in your ethics it's not a change even in your religion 
It's not now I, I used to be irresponsible, but now I'm now responsible. I used to not make my bed. Now I'm making it. I used to not care about school. Now I'm caring about school. I used to goof off at work. Now I'm trying real hard. It's, that's not sanctification, though those things may evidence uh, themselves from your sanctification. Neither is it adopting Christian manners or just simply, uh, you know, I, I used to act like a heathen. Now I'm acting like a Christian. You know, I used to pay back, you know, uh, you know eye for an eye. But now, hey, I, I let things slide. Uh, no, it's, it's not that. Sanctification is change within, coming without, because of your union and communion with Jesus Christ. It is transformation. Scriptures uses the word metamorphosis. Jesus was metamorphosized on the Mount of Transfiguration. That's the actual word in the Greek. Paul says that when we behold Christ by faith, we undergo a metamorphosis, a change from glory to glory. That's sanctification. That's real change. The very first paragraph in the uh, Belgic Confession that we, uh, that we read uh, talks about uh, the old being put off and the new uh, being uh, put on uh, in your life. And on the back of your uh, sermon notes today, if you have those, I went ahead and did something a little different. Uh, reached out beyond our confessional boundaries into some of the Presbyterian confessional boundaries that I just so happen to be familiar with, having been formerly Presbyterian. Uh, but uh, all those confessions are in the same orbit anyway. Uh, they just say things a little differently. And when we get our new hymnals, our new Psalter hymnals, all those uh, confessions uh, will be there, our own three, uh, the Triple Unity, uh, and also the three Westminster, the, the Confession and the two Catechisms also. But uh, here I want to draw your attention uh, to the larger catechism in the middle there in the back of your uh, sermon outline where it asks the question in the larger catechism, what is sanctification? Sanctification is a work of God's grace whereby they whom God has before the foundation of the world chosen to be holy are in time through the powerful operation of his spirit applying the death and resurrection of Christ unto them, renewed in their whole man after the image of God, having the seeds of repentance unto life and all their saving graces put into their hearts, and those graces so stirred up, increased and strengthened, as that they more and more die unto sin and rise unto newness of life. Notice what sanctification is. It's reaching back by the Holy Spirit into the historic death and resurrection of Jesus, and applying it to your interior life, your heart, so that the outcome is you die more and more into sin and more and more are raised, as it says, unto newness of life. Sanctification is nothing other than the dynamic union and communion with the person and work of Jesus Christ. It is not morality. A non-Christian can get pretty moral. It is transformation after Jesus Christ. A dying to sin, a rising in the newness of life, which the Holy Spirit accomplishes as he applies Christ and his death and his resurrection to our hearts. All right, well, in your sermon outline, you have number one, sanctification is joined to, but separate from justification. Very important to understand this distinction. The whole Reformation uh, would not have occurred apart from this distinction. It wouldn't have been worth it. But this made it worth it. We must distinguish between the two. Justification, as we've already seen, that is an imputed righteousness, is a legal term that renders us safe and confident to stand before God and his searching judgment. Because in justification, as we trust in what Christ has done, we hear the voice of God saying to us in the gospel, you are righteous in my sight. You've passed through my judgment. And in Jesus Christ, you've been declared righteous in my sight. So that God might be just, as Romans 3 says, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And that justifying verdict, just to get the sense of this, the strength of it, comes to us while we are ungodly. 
Remember Romans 4 or 5? God justifies what? The ungodly. <laughs> so even though you sin, even though you believe in Jesus and you sin and fail and stumble in your life, does that mean you lose your justification? No. Your justification is secure. Even though you as a Christian fumble and stumble around through life. It's okay. You're safe. Because God justifies the ungodly. Jesus came to redeem those who are under the curse of the law by becoming a curse for them. That's justification. But sanctification, though it is with justification, never to be separated from it, is different. It's different. Again, look at the, uh, on the back of your sermon outline uh, on the larger catechism, question number 77, where it asks this very question, where do justification and sanctification differ? Well, here's the answer. Although sanctification be inseparably joined with justification, yet they differ. In that God, in justification, imputeth the righteousness of Christ. In sanctification, his spirit infuseth grace and enableth to the exercise thereof. In the former, that is in justification, sin is pardoned. In the other, that is sanctification, it is subdued. In the one, the one doth equally free all believers from the revenging wrath of God. And that perfectly in this life, that they never fall into condemnation. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, just beginning, all kinds of problems in your life, all kinds of sins you're still struggling with, or if you're an old believer and you're, you've grown in purity and holiness and confidence in the Lord, guess what? You're in the same state with regard to justification, the new or the old. You're both free from the wrath of God. And, guess what? You're both perfectly justified, not one more than the other even though there's a difference in spiritual growth and time spent knowing Christ in your life. Now, notice that final sentence then with regard to sanctification. The other, that is sanctification, is neither equal in all, some are more sanctified than others, nor in this life perfect, we never reach perfection in personal godliness, but growing up to perfection. That's the goal. So we see there's two different benefits, justification sanctification. Different, but always joined together. So when we hear the gospel message, the gospel message says, Jesus Christ comes to forgive your sins, and Jesus Christ comes to deliver you from sin's dominion. That's justification and sanctification, both found in Jesus Christ. Never to be separated, but never to be melted into each other in terms of what they mean. Listen to what John Calvin says. This is from John Calvin's Institutes, and he actually quotes 1 Corinthians 30 here. I found it to be very interesting. Why then are we justified by faith? Because by faith we grasp Christ's righteousness, by which alone we are reconciled to God. Yet you could not grasp this without at the same time grasping sanctification also. For, quote, he is given unto us for righteousness, wisdom, sanctification, and redemption, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Therefore, Christ justifies no one whom he does not at the same time sanctify. These benefits are joined together by an everlasting and indissoluble bond so that those whom he illumines by his wisdom, he redeems. Those whom he redeems, he justifies. Those whom he justifies, he sanctifies. Love the way Calvin puts that. So, justification and sanctification are the two benefits that are in Christ. You need Christ. And when you have Christ, you have his benefits of being justified and being sanctified. And each of those answer two different aspects of our sin. Because at the end of the day, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Well, what does the Savior do with regard to the guilt of my sin? Well, he justifies me. He says you're forgiven and righteous in the sight of God. Your guilt cannot condemn you. But what does he do with regard to the grip of my sin? holding me in bondage, 
Even though sometimes I want to change, I keep going back and finding myself there as if I'm just a slave to sin in every sense of the word, and there's no change that can possibly occur. Well, he sanctifies. He delivers from that bondage. Now, we must, again, we must understand when we speak of sanctification, what is it we're speaking about is not morality, point two. What are we talking about? We're talking about the Holy Spirit's applying to us the cross and resurrection of Jesus. In the Heidelberg Catechism, questions 88 through 90, it talks about repentance from sin. And what is repentance from sin? Heidelberg Catechism answers, it says it's, it's dying of the old and it's a coming to life of the new. That's repentance from sin. Very important. That we do not separate sanctification from justification. Very important that we don't say, uh, well, look, uh, you know, give me justification. You know, I, I don't want to go to hell, but uh, don't give me sanctification. Hey, I, I'm kind of enjoying kind of how, how I'm doing things here. You know, it's like going to McDonald's or Burger King and saying, you know, hold the tomato, you know, hold the cheese. Or don't, I don't want the bun, just give me the meat. You know, I, I want justification. That sounds good. That sounds safe. But hey, sanctification is a little too demanding for me right now. Please hold back. No, you can't. It doesn't work that way. There is a putting to death of the old. There is a rising of the new. And that can occur nowhere outside of Jesus Christ and his cross, his resurrection. See, there's no real repentance outside of union with Jesus Christ. People might improve. They might feel bad. They maybe used to be drunkards and no longer are drunkards. And they used to be immoral. Now they're faithful to their marriages. That's all fine and dandy and good, and we approve of that, of course. But it's not sanctification. Sanctification is, arises out of the Holy Spirit bringing us into union with Christ and his work. As the larger catechism says, it's the Holy Spirit applying the death and resurrection of Christ. Look, if you would, again, on the back of your uh, sermon outline, the Westminster Confession of Faith, not the catechism, but the confession of sanctification, chapter 13. They who are effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are farther sanctified, really and personally, through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection. See how, the, see how the Westminster Confession puts it. It's through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection. By, see here's the application part, by his word and spirit dwelling in them. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed. The several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified. That is, and mortified doesn't mean that those lusts are embarrassed to death. It means that they're actually put to death, mortified from mortification. And they more and more quicken and strengthen in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness, and without which no man uh, shall see the Lord. So how does sanctification occur? How does it happen concretely? How does it happen? It's when by faith we take Christ in from his word. The word opens up to us Christ and what he has done. Christ and his offices. Christ and his saving power. Christ and his person. So that our faith is in him. And the more we see of Christ and trust in Christ, the more that transformation uh, occurs. The more we are, as it is, metamorphosized. Renewed, transformed, sanctified, really and truly, as the Westminster Confession says, in our persons. Well, if that's the case, then, you know, when you come to church on Sunday morning, one of the things you should say that I'm after when I come to church, I want to I be more holy. I want to be closer to Christ. I, I want to be more transformed. Well, you've, you've come to the right place if the word of God is being preached. Because that's the means through which it happens, by his word and spirit. It's not about the music. It's not about uh, trumping up some religious feelings. It's not about any of those exterior things that may be part of the entire complex of worship. But it is first and foremost 
plainly and simply, hearing the Word of God and the portrait of Jesus Christ and His person and work through that Word is the means through which you lay hold of Him and are transformed and sanctified. Moved along from the carnal to the spiritual, from the earthly to the heavenly. And therefore, it's absolutely vital to us, brothers and sisters in Christ. As 1 Peter 2, 2 says, if you've been born by the word of truth, what do you do? Well, like a baby, you should long for the pure milk of the word. Pure milk of the word, by which you grow thereby. It's through the word. We feed on Christ. <laughs> That's why it's so important that when the word is preached, there's both law and there's both gospel. Law may, drives you to your deep need and awareness of Christ. Gospel says, here's the answer for you. Here's the grace that you so desperately need. And you feed on Christ through his word. And of course, through his sacrament. Because what is the word? It's, it, the, the preached word is the audible word. We hear it. You can close your eyes in church and still hear the word. And be benefited by it. You don't have to be looking up here. You know, we don't have to have a personal thing between me and you. You can close your eyes. You can hear the word. Because it's an audible word. That's the main means of your sanctification. So through which you feed on Christ. And brothers and sisters, we need not only an audible word. We need an edible word. When we come here every Sunday by Sunday, we have not only an audible word, but we have an edible word. We have the word visibly on display in the sacrament of bread and wine. So again, you are pointed by way of these sacraments to what? To bread and wine? No. Uh, we, we say here's the body of Christ. Here's the blood of Christ for you. Jesus Christ comes in his redemptive benefit of what he's achieved in his body and his blood in bread and wine so that you enter into communion with him. You feed on him. You take him in and you receive his benefits and union and communion with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. You see, you see here, this is why sanctification is it's not morality. It's, it's not religion. It's not cliches and feelings and little formulas. It's true growth of the soul. It's a true nourishing and feeding of the soul in communion with the person and work of Jesus Christ. And this is what the church is chiefly is to be about. And that's why every Sunday, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, a member of this church, you should be here. You should be here. 9.15 to 12.15 or 12.20, whenever we end. Why? Because this is the means that Christ employs for your sanctification. The premier means. The public ministry of word and sacrament. The public as it is offering to you afresh to your soul. Jesus and his death and resurrection. That the old in you would die and the new would be strengthened and nourished for sanctification. Now, sanctification that we've been talking about so far has been progressive, growth. But sanctification actually has three aspects to it. You see this in point three in your outline in the sermon. Sanctification has an inaugural aspect, which is definitive sanctification. Sanctification has a, a progressive growing aspect, which is progressive sanctification. But sanctification also has its goal, perfection. Hey, if Jesus Christ is your Savior, you are headed toward perfection. What a day that will be to love Jesus Christ with unsinning heart with unclouded mind, with, with unscrambled affections. We can only imagine. We have a little taste of it from time to time. But that's where your sanctification is headed. So first of all, sanctification is definitive. 
We don't continue in sin. Why do we not continue in sin? Because we're joined to Christ. We read this in Romans chapter 6. Paul says, why do you not continue in sin? Because if you sin, you won't be justified anymore. Paul does not say that. Matter of fact, if you go ahead and sin two times, three times, four times, a thousand times after being justified in Jesus Christ, you will still be justified in Jesus Christ. Because once justified, always justified. Once you've passed through God's judgment, you've always passed through God's judgment. But keep in mind, if you've been justified, you're also sanctified. <laughs> Can't tear them apart. Can't order up Jesus the way you want him. You must have a whole Christ. But Romans chapter 6 goes on to say that you've been definitively, inaugurally sanctified because your old man, Paul says, the old you in Adam, the old anthropos, has been crucified with Christ and a new man has emerged in resurrection power so that you are no longer a slave to sin. Sin no longer is the dominating note of your life. Yes, you struggle with it. Yes, sometimes it tackles you and gets you down. Yes, sometimes you may go through long periods of wrestling with this, that, or the other sin in your life. But as a fundamental reality, you are no longer a slave to sin. You've been set free by the sanctifying power of the gospel in Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 6, verse 18, Paul so wondrously says, You've been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. You're new. It's not the same anymore. A definitive, sanctifying change has occurred in the believer in Jesus Christ. And if there is no definitive, sanctifying change that has occurred, then hey, go back to the cross and say, Lord Jesus, make me yours, truly, holy. Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel, as he looked forward to the days of the new covenant, said, God says, I will take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's that definitive sanctification. I will wash you from all your impurities and from all your idols. That's definitive sanctification. Ezekiel, looking forward to the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Well, I'll tell you, when God takes out that heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh, you're no longer a superficial Christian. You're not just a pretend Christian. You're not just an outward Christian. You, you have a new love. You have new desires and new motivations. There's a new power that's at work in your life. A new divine psychosurgery has happened to you. A babe has been born. Definitive sanctification. But that same sanctification then erupts, grows. It begins there definitively, but then progresses through growth over time as we attend to the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 4, remember we looked at that text earlier and spent quite a bit of time in that. Ephesians chapter 4 about the ministry of the Word, speaking the truth in love, and how that has a transformative effect that caused the body to grow up and, and not only to grow up in response and maturity to the preaching and ministry of the word, but in its interaction with each other, the body itself builds itself up in love as the body attends to the word of God. Progress, growth, and grace really, truly occurring. But sanctification also has an end point. It's headed somewhere. You mean to say I'm not going to spend all eternity struggling with my sin. That's right. That's exactly the truth. Now's the time for, for battle. The time's going to come. You're going to lay down your weapons of war because you're going to be at total 100% peace. Colossians chapter 3, verse 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. That's the consummation. That's heaven. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, We shall be like him because we shall see him as he is at his appearing. There is a transforming power to, for the believer when he sees the visible resurrected Christ. It will change him in the twinkling of an eye, Paul says. From this body, fashioned after the image of the first Adam, 
to a body and soul fashion after the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Ephesians, remember in Ephesians 1 earlier on, we saw that we are elected to be holy and blameless before him in love. Why did God choose you? Why did he choose me? To bring us to the goal. Holy, blameless. In this very text we read this morning in Ephesians chapter 5, it says that, he, that through the washing of water of the word, we will eventually come to the point where we will stand before him without spot or wrinkle. Well, those are just tiny imperfections. You know, if I, if I got close up somewhere and looked at the skin in your face, I get, oh, look at that little spot there. Oh, look at that. Oh, a little bit of acne there. Oh, a little more. You know, you, you, little spots. Or I might examine your clothes and say, hey, that's a nice shirt, but... Yeah, a little wrinkle right there. <laughs> spot or wrinkle, small things. There will not be any spot or any wrinkle in you and me. That's too good to be true. Well, it is true. <laughs> it's too good for anything we've ever merited or deserved. That's for sure. Sanctification, brothers and sisters, is headed somewhere. Remember we talked about the golden chain, the last link in the golden chain is glorification, conformity to Jesus Christ. That's nothing other than our consummate sanctification. Yes, the day will come when you and I will stand before Jesus Christ and just like we sing in the hymn, we will love him with an unsinning heart. But right now, we are caught in between. The already and not yet of sanctification. Already definitively sanctified, not yet consummatively sanctified. And we hope with joy at the prospect of where we're headed. And in the meantime, we groan at the prospect of what's not here yet. Well, what are the means through which we move along in sanctification? What does the Holy Spirit use to sanctify his people? In Ephesians 5.26, which we read in the former service, we read that Jesus Christ cleanses his bride through the washing of water by his word. By his word, he carries us along. That word preached must be heard audibly. That word that we participate in edibly as a word that we must mix with faith. Forsaking all, I trust him. That's faith. I look to Christ and Christ alone. Christ, as the reformer says, comes to us clothed in word and sacrament. And when Christ comes to us clothed in word and sacrament, we greet him, we meet him, and we are transformed by him. Why do we gather here Sunday by Sunday? I, I, I announce it almost every week. Something along the lines of, we have gathered here to meet with Jesus Christ through word and sacrament. And that's how God sanctifies his people. So how important it is that we take it to heart. You know, you can listen to preaching and you can take the sacraments like a, just a stream of consciousness running across the top of your brain, you know. You know, kind of in, uh, okay, check, I did that. Now we must take that word in, and in, 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 in Scripture says we, we need to meditate upon it. It means to think deeply, to drink deeply of what that word is setting before us, of Christ and what he's done. But that's not the end of it. Ephesians says we grow in sanctification with each other. Having heard that word together and interact with each other. You know, you might think to yourself that there are people in the body of Christ here who doesn't have much to offer you, so you don't ever talk to them. You're wrong. Everybody in the body of Christ has something to bring and to give to every other member in the body of Christ. 
generally stop and allow yourself to receive it. Christ has made us members of him and of each other to sanctify us. Ephesians chapter 4. To build up ourselves in, in Jesus Christ. Be transformed by Christ. How grateful we should be for the members of the body of Christ. If I take a single match and light it up against the wind, it's easily blown out. But I take that whole book of matches, I light that whole book of matches. And then from that book of matches, I light some balsa wood, and from balsa wood, I light some, some other wood, and from that wood, I light some more. What do, what, do, what do we have? The more you have of it, the stronger it is to stand and to burn brightly. Brothers and sisters, God has seen fit to use each other to help us to grow in Jesus Christ. And probably the people that we find the most difficult, probably the people that rub us the wrong way or we find the least interesting, are actually the ones that are most useful to us to help us to grow in the love, the true love of Jesus Christ, one for the other. I'll never forget, and I love to repeat that great saying by the Princeton theologian Charles Hodge. You've heard it from me several times. Charles Hodge says that we, we are sanctified not only through the communion of the saints, but through the collision of the saints. That's right. You think, oh no, uh, uh, we're having a conflict. It's okay, calm down. What does God want you to do to resolve that conflict? What's the loving pathway to take? And you pursue it and you seek it. You strive after it. And you find what? You find that you grow through it. You find you grow in your sanctification. Your otherwise old, fallen man way is simply to hold on to your resentments or pretend you're not resentful. You don't do that anymore. You find to go ahead, I'm going to deal with this thing. I'm going to resolve this problem so that I could grow in my sanctification in Christ. God uses his word, audible, edible. God uses each other and God uses providence. In all the providences of life, God uses to polish his saints. Remember old Job? All those providential situations in his life, do you think those are all for nothing? You know, the book of James tells us the Lord, that Job grew in patience. What a virtue. Providence. All the things that happen to us that we don't want to happen, happen by God's providence. Before church this morning, I heard a story of a young man that went through a series of Unbelievable mishaps. I felt sorry for him. <laughs> but you know something? God's got that under control. <laughs> and he's just like throwing rocks into a tumbler. He was tumbling up that young man. And through providence, he's sanctifying him. Sanctification is the, pleasure, the, brush, the precious gift of God's grace to each of us who are believers in Jesus Christ. Sanctification is nothing less than the Spirit's work of drawing us ever more deeply into Jesus Christ, to his person and his work, of ever more applying to us the power of the cross to put to death our sins and the power of his resurrection to invigorate us to walk that heavenly walk. Well, who gets the credit for all this? Who gets the credit for all this? Well, sanctification is like a pump. You know, the pump's got the water and you just got to go over there and pump it and you'll get there. Well, then, you know, God gets the credit for making the pump, and you get the credit for pumping the pump. <laughs> yeah, share, sh share, shared credit. It's not the biblical picture, though, is it? The Apostle Paul, I want to share with you four concluding verses here. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, that he worked harder than all the other apostles before him. Yet it was not him who works, but the grace of God that was working in him. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, which is quoted, by the way, in our Belgic Confession that we read this morning, he, the Apostle Paul says that God is at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. Therefore, what? You work out your salvation. You work out your salvation. Why? Because God is working it in you. Yeah, you have a, you have a, you, you're a participant, but God is the one who's 
bringing out the reality. For who started your sanctification in the first place? <laughs> and who's going to finish your sanctification in the second place? <laughs> you know the answer to that's the grace of God. Well, who do you think is handling things in between the first place and the second place? Who do you think is growing you in between? 1 Corinthians 3, 6 says Paul, uh, Paul, uh, Paul planted and Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. God gave the growth. God is the one who's behind the growth, the increase of your sanctification. His sovereignty saves you. His sovereign arrival will finish you. And in between, he is the one who is sovereignly at work in you, growing you. What a beautiful text Philippians 1.6 is. It says it all. He who began a good work in you, definitive sanctification, will perfect it at the day of Jesus Christ. Consummated sanctification. What's the point? That God is the one who's carrying you through progressively from start to finish. So let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let us pray.